called fumarate uh, and show how it can be polarized via parahydrogen. And I believe we, we now have a path to take this to in vivo application. So without further ado, I'll, I'll get started. I'm just going to put up this slide with some, some of the facts about this molecule on it. It's, uh, we call it like a three spin system because the fumarate molecule at natural abundance, we can, we can pay attention to or take interest in the molecules where there's natural abundance carbon 13s here. Uh, that's uh, about 2% natural abundance because it's a symmetric molecule. Um, and we talk about this as being a three spin system because we, we care about the protons and the carbon. And we can say it's in the near equivalence regime where the proton proton J couplings much stronger than the difference in proton carbon J couplings. Uh, so I'll just leave that up for a moment. And because later in the presentation, I'll do a little, I'll have a little video. I'm going to do a volume test now. Okay, so, so fingers crossed that wasn't too too loud, and if it was, uh, I guess that, that's a little heads up to adjust for the for the video later on. So I'm going to start by telling a little story about fumarate, going back about five years to when I started my PhD. Uh, and what I started my PhD on was developing pulse sequences. Actually, uh, sorry, Patrick, can I ask for a moment? Are you able to see my mouse here? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, okay, fantastic. I'll just use this as a little pointer. So... Yeah, I started my PhD developing pulse sequences, uh, working on taking some pulse sequences that have been shown for the sort of homonuclear spin order transformations that Malcolm talked about earlier, and applying them to these three spin systems. And it turns out fumarate is just a great molecule to demonstrate this on, because it's in the near equivalence regime, where the singlet state between the protons is very close to being an eigenstate, because the J coupling between those dominates the J coupling network. So, so we work with that molecule for that reason. But then it turned out that when in the same paper, when we came to do like a demonstration of these, uh, of these pulse techniques with FIP, we actually had to cis-hydrogenate this starting material and form malleate. So malleate is the cis isomer of, uh, of the same molecule. And we, we successfully demonstrate the pulse sequence, but it sort of glossed over a little bit. It was a, a, a slight embarrassment for me, certainly, that we that we demonstrate all these pulse sequences on this molecule, and then we have to use the cis isomer for the for the actual fit demonstration. And I ended up spending out maybe six months or so working out different ways of of producing this malleate molecule via FIP, and then doing some sort of cis trans isomerism to form fumarate, which is the much more interesting. This molecule is toxic, but fumarate is a much more interesting biomolecule. Now, in the process of doing that. At some point, I was adding HCL to these solutions to try to speed up that uh, cis-trans isomerism. And when I did that, I had sodium fumarate in solution, in, in aqueous solution. And that's relatively soluble uh, to a, just over a molar. When I added HCL to these solutions, it all just crashed out immediately. It's fumaric acid. And that was somewhat interesting. We thought, hmm, especially being in Malcolm's group where... Uh, Malcolm's done a lot of work with solid state NMR. There was this thought, well, what if, uh, what if we can use this sort of uh, precipitation, redissolution type of physicochemical manipulation to, uh, to see some interesting spin properties of the molecule? A uh, quick little note here, all of these experiments were done in DMSO D6 because fumarate is so insoluble in just about all common solvents, including water. And so those sort of experiments, uh, that, that's what we did next, where we would have solutions of fumarate in a magnet in the solution state. And you can just do like a inversion recovery type of T1 measurement on the carbon-13 spins in, in fumarate. And what we wanted to try was, is it possible to perform the inversion recovery experiment and introduce this precipitation and redissolution steps halfway through? So the idea being that you, you apply a pi pulse to in, invert the carbon-13 spins in fumarate, you then inject acid very rapidly uh, to the, into the solution to precipitate out solid fumarate. And at that point, you wait a variable amount of time for the relaxation. You then redissolve it in sodium hydroxide and measure out the signal. 
So we did that. Um, here's a little picture of the solid fumarate molecules. And if you do this sort of experiment, it actually turns out that it sort of, to my surprise, it actually worked. The T1 in the solid state is notably longer than in the solution state. So that was like a cool little demonstration. Um, we went a little bit further and just took some field dependence T1 data for, for fumaric acid in the solid state and some temperature dependent data, just showing that as you go to lower temperatures, as expected, the carbon-13 T1 really sort of blows up. We never really made it down to liquid helium temperature. Um, but that was all, all like a neat demonstration. And the problem was I couldn't really marry those two things together. The, on the one hand, using FIP to, to polarize carbon-13 spins and molecules. And on the other hand, showing like storage of this uh, hyperpolarized carbon-13, uh, uh, showing storage of carbon-13 spin order. So at some point, I was in Mainz collaborating with John Blanchard and Dima Budka and bumped into Barbara Ripka, who was working for Kirsten Munneman. And it turned out she was working on a special type of ruthenium catalyst that would transhydrogenate the, the same starting material to fumarate. And this all occurs in water, in D2 in this case. And then, of course, with RF pulse sequences, we could polarize the carbon-13. So that was really something of a, you know, my, my thought was, well, yeah, obviously we're gonna, we're gonna do that. This is, this is absolutely perfect. Um, the problems that they were having were with the reaction chemistry. It's a, it's a very slow reaction in comparison to the cis hydrogenations that a lot of people work with in acetone or methanol. This is much, much slower. And it turned out by adding some oxygen scavengers, Bob was trying different oxygen scavengers in the samples. Well, she added one molecule, sodium sulfite, which just enormously increased the rate of reaction by one to two orders of magnitude. And this was like a real breakthrough. This, was, this took that reaction to being something that we could actually produce these molecules with up to a few percent polarization on the carbon-13 spin. And so even back then, we sort of, we, we put this in our, in our paper discussion. We said, we, we hope to combine this polarization method with procedures to extend carbon-13 T1 by precipitation of fumarate. So even back then, this was a sort of, the hope was to combine these two things together. So why fumarate though? Why, why is there interest in this molecule? It's used in the DMP community. Uh, they polarize the molecule, as shown here as singly labeled fumarate. They actually use doubly labeled, doubly carbon-13 labeled fumarate. They'll polarize this molecule, they put it in like a spin lab and, and spit it out with hyperpolarized carbon spin order. And that can then be injected in vivo and this biological reaction is monitored. So this reaction is part of the Krebs cycle, uh, and it's the conversion of fumarate to malate catalyzed by this enzyme. And it turns out this is a probe of cell necrosis in the body. So in, in this work by Ferdia Gallagher, uh, the researchers inject fumarate into, into mice, and by observing the amount of malate that forms, you can determine how much cell necrosis has, has occurred. In this specific case, they were looking at uh, how well tumors are responding to, to treatment. And the, so they, they treat the tumors. If the tumors are responding well, a great deal of cell necrosis, many cells are dead, you see a lot more conversion to malate. And in similar work, uh, researchers have injected hyperbolized fumarate to, uh, to image myocardial infarctions. The idea being that you just inject a load of fumarate into the, into the heart. And in both uh, cases, you'll see absolutely loads of fumarate in the control experiment where all the cells are healthy, there's next to no conversion to malate. Whereas in the case where, where uh, the heart is infarct, there is conversion to malate. You see that pop up in the image. And I can give a brief little explanation as to why that is. For fumarate to get into cells, it has to go through these dicarboxylic acid transporter proteins on the surface. And that's a very slow process and, and slow meaning on the time scale of nuclear spin relaxation. So you think the carbon-13 T1 is something like 60 seconds or so. The idea being that fumarate isn't going to get into the cells on that sort of time scale. So if you have a healthy cell, the fumarate will sort of, you can inject it in the body, but none of it goes inside. It doesn't have any access to the enzyme, which would convert it to malate. In the case where the cells are, um, are dead or ruptured, the enzyme can leak into the surrounding tissue and catalyze the enzymatic conversion of fumarate into malate. And that's what's imaged. That's why you get contrast in these experiments. Okay, so that's taken us to where we are now and this work. 
So in this work, we're now trying to take this further. We're trying to produce fumarate in much higher concentrations and, and, and do this precipitation redissolution with it. So to do that, we work with a steel reactor where we can, in principle, go to much higher hydrogen pressures and flow much faster. So in this sort of experiment, we, we put our reaction solution here, seal everything up, bubble parahydrogen in, and then we will eject the sample through a, a solenoid guiding field into a metal shield. And the shield shields out magnetic fields um, from the lab. And we can perform field cycling in here. So that's this magnetic field cycle part. Down, down in that shield, we perform the field cycle to polarize the carbon-13 nucleus. I have, to, oh, oh, there we go. I have to acknowledge John Blanchard here for coming up with this reactor design and having the general attitude of, we should just absolutely be going to higher pressures, higher flow rates, using engineering uh, to, uh, to improve our FIP reactions. So here are a couple of pictures of that setup. Here's our magnetic shield. The solenoid, this is just going to provide a magnetic field while the sample goes in and out of the shield, just to ensure that it doesn't uh, undergo any zero field crossings. And then here we have a picture of the reactor, which is insulated. And we use a couple of heater mats just to heat the whole thing up to something like uh, 90 Celsius. OK, uh, brief, brief uh, note on field cycling. I talk about this, I guess this is going to be covered probably in a, in a few different talks in this conference, but maybe I can just give a brief little uh, mention of what, what it means to perform a field cycle. The idea is that if you have a three spin system, you can plot the uh, eigenvalues as a function of magnetic field, and you can label those with, this, with the uh, eigenstates they roughly correspond to. And when you perform a FIP reaction at Let's, let's call it high field. I mean, it's only one microtesla, but let's call that high field. The, the uh, singlet state between the protons is very close to being an eigenstate. And this letter here, alpha beta, corresponds to the carbon spin state. So while well, the carbon is completely unpolarized to, to, a, to a good approximation. So we can say that we populate these two states. By rapidly uh, switching the field to, to zero, we say non-adiabatically, the populations remain in those diabatic eigenstates, and they come down here. Essentially, the, the spins didn't have time to evolve into the new uh, conditions. And then we can, that's my mouse, and then by adiabatically ramping the field up, the populations will follow the instantaneous eigenstate. And well, OK, for this case, sing, singlet beta, that there are no uh, avoided crossings for that state. The population just happily stays there. But uh, these states are mixed, and so if, you, if you're adiabatic, the populations come down here, and you end up having fully populated uh, singlet naught beta and triplet plus beta. So you see that you've lost some degree of uh, proton spin polarization. But the carbon is now fully polarized in the beta state. Uh, and I actually, I, I have to thank Christian Bengs here for, uh, for his involvement in this work and certainly helping me understand the physics going on here. OK, so oh, I will pop up soon. So in this work, we perform that sort of reaction in our, in our steel reactor. So we're going to bubble parahydrogen at Earth's field, and then we'll eject the sample down, perform a magnetic field sweep from 50 nanotesla, so very close to zero field, up to a microtesla. And then we transport the sample over to a high field magnet. We, go, we perform a magnetic field sweep. And then we transfer the sample to a high field magnet, uh, spin solve, and detect. So the first results are, are experiments in which we're just characterizing how well, this, this, uh, how well we can hydrogenate fumarate. And so we're going to vary the bubbling time. And what I plot here is concentration in green. I hope you can see that. That's the points that just uh, go up close to linearly here. And polarization level in blue. So what we see is pretty much expected as we just increase the duration for which we bubble parahydrogen in, we form more and more fumarate. And we end up, if we bubble for like 90 seconds, we end up close to 200 millimolar of fumarate. And then we can look at the polarization level for those samples. And as expected, it pretty much decreases as you go to longer bubbling times. But even at 90 second reactant times, you're still at about 13% carbon polarization by the time you, uh, you extract the sample from the shield, run over the spin solve, and detect. 
So at this point, I would like to introduce a, a new plot that I think we should be using more in the field, perhaps, which is the combination of the concentration and polarization of the spins that have that are being produced. So we can call this something like a molar polarization, where the units are concentration. Uh, so here I plot that in millimolar. And this looks pretty much as you would expect it to look. You, you increase the bubbling time, your molar polarization, and you can, you can sort of think of that as being the concentration of fumarate molecules in the solution that are at unity polarization. That goes up over time. And as you get to, as the bubbling time reaches or goes beyond the, the proton singlet lifetime, it starts to tail off. So that's all, uh, I guess that's sort of as expected. And for a little comparison, when uh, doing experiments in Torino, uh, Eleonora shakes uh, samples in like glass tubes for 10 seconds. Uh, so for doing that with the same, uh, for the same reaction, she, she formed 45 millimolar fumarate at like 31% polarization. So if we look at our little plot down here, 10 seconds of uh, reaction time. She's, she's actually up here. She's doing better than the steel reactor for short uh, for the short reaction times. And that just go. I think that really goes to show how good it is just shaking tubes. And people are still doing it. Uh, it's been you know for for years and years. People are just shaking NMR tubes because it's a great way to get hydrogen into the solution. Although I think uh, I think where we can really win here is going to we're working at like eight and a half bar. As soon as some uh, safety inspections have been done, we should be able to then just jump up to something like 50 bar of, of power hydrogen in this reactor. Then I think we can really start to win, and especially for long bubbling durations. Okay, so here is now again a picture of the whole experiment uh, where I include this uh, precipitation stage. So, so here's our chemical reaction, here's our reactor. We're going to do the reaction. We're going to shoot the sample down to the shield, polarize the carbon-13 spins. Uh, and then what we can do is take some of that solution and add it to hydrochloric acid waiting on a glass center in a magnetic field. And the fumarate should precipitate out as a pure solid. And we can filter off the unwanted reaction side products, catalyst molecules, and unreacted starting material. So I think I have a little um, a slide showing that process here. So we have like a glass center and we have some hydrochloric acid waiting on it. We add our sample and the fumaric acid precipitates out as a pure solid. Oh, excuse me. The fumaric acid precipitates out as a pure solid. We can then vacuum that off and wash the, the solid with water. And then when ready, uh, we would dissolve that in sodium hydroxide and then extract the whole solution and go in and measure it. That's all done in, in a Halbach magnet. And, and I'd like to acknowledge George Picanu from Southampton who helped develop a lot of these, uh, just the actual hands-on procedure of doing this. And uh, Peter Blumler from Mainz who has been a really great help with uh, helping me build like Halbachs and whatnot. But I think for him, this is probably extremely trivial, but uh, it, really grand help. So now I have a little video just showing that whole process uh, for the next couple of minutes.
Okay, all right, then I'll, I'll try and wrap up then. So to do those experiments, we, as you see, we're injecting the sample, uh, we, we polarize it, and then we extract it into the, and perform the precipitation. Uh, and so I can show that by doing that, we form 25%, uh, we have 25% carbon polarization on something like 63 millimolar fumarate in those samples. Uh, and I can show T1 data to, so, so you can see that for the control samples and the precipitated samples, the T1 is more or less the same. There's, there's nothing really funny going on there in the solution state. Um, this here is our, is our data where we see the control versus the precipitation experiments and show very importantly that there's nothing funny going on. There's no really fast relaxation process that leads to a, a significant drop in the polarization level of the precipitated material. So we don't see any, any notable drop. If we perform the reaction without the Halbach uh, to, to provide a, a large external field, we just lose all the spin order to as dipolar order. We see no polarization. Um, so I think maybe I can maybe I can jump over these parts. This is just showing uh, the purification, um, and that we can then use this this purified material to perform uh, enzymatic uh, observations. Um, so to conclude. I think we're absolutely at the point now of competing with DNP. Uh, one of the big drawbacks for us is that we can only work with the singly carbon labeled molecules. Uh, Malcolm talked earlier about unitary bounds on, on spin order transfer. Well, it turns out, yeah, basically uh, you can't do better than getting to 100% carbon polarization or 50% on two carbon 13s. So that's certainly a limitation for us. But, um, but I'm excited to see how this work uh, can be taken forward into, into preclinical labs. So I would love to thank all of these people who have, who have been a part of this project specifically. Um, and, and really in particular, this group of postdocs who, uh, who all, we all went together to Berkeley to visit uh, Alex Pines and Daniel Barsky uh, with the hopes of doing some in vivo imaging with fit polarized fumarate in San Francisco. But really unfortunately, coronavirus halted those plans. But, um, but huge thanks to those, those people who uh, it was really fantastic to work with. So thanks very much. Thank you very much for your talk. We have time for a couple questions. Um, so one that was asked is, what is the, do you know that any reasoning behind why the sodium sulfate aids in providing more trans product versus a cis product in your hydrochloride through fumarate? No. No, I have absolutely and no idea. This is, I'm, uh, this is, uh, really, uh, it's quite an embarrassment, really, but we, we, we don't know why. Um, there are some students in Gerd Bunkowski's group looking into that now. Um, it's a big open question, and I think that's, there's absolutely room for improvement if uh, through collaboration with people who know a lot more about organic chemistry than I, I do, um, and inorganic like coordination chemistry, to improve like the rates of reaction from this catalyst, certainly. And just one more question. What's the hyperpolarized uh, T1 on fumarate? Um, uh, so it's six, the carbon-13 T1, something like 60 seconds in vivo. Um, and that basically goes down at higher fields as you approach a few Tesla because uh, chemical shift dinosotropy starts to kick in. Great. Thank you so much. I think we're going to have to move on to the next talk now. Yeah, thanks very much.